Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being with us. We're really glad you're here. We pray our service will be a blessing to you. We've got a couple of things we'd like to share with you before we start the service. Uh, first of all, if you have your cell phone with you, perhaps we could ask you to put it on vibrate or maybe even to turn it off so it doesn't go off perhaps during the service and disturb our worship. Excuse me. Second, um, after the service, we'd just like to point you to a little wicker basket that's on the uh, bulletin table. We have contact with a woman named Brandy Kolke, who is having, well, heart failure in her late 20s, and she's also pregnant at the same time, and she has seven children, and uh, the family is in need of financial help. And so we're taking offerings for them. We're going to give them gift cards and perhaps some clothing for the children. Also, as you know is our custom, uh, late in the service we'll be turning off all the lights and we'll sing Silent Night by Candlelight. You should have been given a candle as you walked in. If you did not get one, you can go back and the ushers can get you one. Also, uh, for the little ones, if you're not sure they're old enough to hold a candle steady, we have one of these. You bend it until you hear a snap and then it glows. Uh, that might be a better choice for some of the little children. So, I think those are the announcements that we wanted to to share with you. Why don't we pause for a moment of private reflection, we'll compose ourselves, and then we will begin the service. We'll begin in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear people of God, once again, it is our joy and delight to ponder the good news of great joy that Christmas proclaims to us. In our hearts and minds, let us go once again to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. Let us hear again the timeless story of how the wonderful love of our gracious God moved him to send his Son to be our Savior. May our hearts be warmed, and may our lives be filled with gladness and true peace as we hear again this good news of great joy. We'll start with the first hymn. It's on page two in your bulletin, or you can follow in the front. The story of Christmas actually starts at the dawn of time in the Garden of Eden. In the beginning, God had made a perfect world with two perfect people. To them, he had given a perfect life with no pain or sadness or even death. Sad to say, the Garden of Eden all too soon became paradise lost as Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. With their disobedience, they drove perfection away and ushered in sin and all its consequences. It is a tragic fact that their sin is passed on to us. Each one of us is sinful. We all have done things that God forbids. Because we are sinful, we will one day die. Because we sin, we deserve a curse and everlasting punishment in hell. Yet we are not without hope. A love that goes beyond our comprehension moved the heart of God to take action and rescue human beings from the hopeless situation they had created. 
In love, God promised that someone special would come and save sinners from the curse of sin and give us life in heaven that will be perfect, glorious, and eternal. God said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And we'll continue with with the song, God Rest Your Merry Gentlemen. At first, Adam and Eve only knew that one of Eve's descendants would defeat the serpent, that is, the devil, who had deceived them and led them to sin. They didn't know the particulars about this Savior to come, but in childlike faith they held tightly to the simple promise God had given them. As the years passed in the Old Testament, God gradually unfolded his plan and revealed more and more of the details about the Savior to come. Tonight we will review several of these prophecies about Jesus. In Micah 5, 2, the Lord tells his people where this Savior would be born. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come the one to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from ancient times, from eternity. In the book of Jeremiah, the Lord told his people from which family this Savior would come. He says in Jeremiah 23, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness.
very familiar prophecy is written for us in Isaiah 9. It speaks of the birth of the coming Savior and reminds us that even though he is born as a son, he is at the same time our mighty God who is everlasting. Let's read responsively these words. If you're in the bulletin, we're on page 3. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. <laughs> For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The authority to rule rests on his shoulders. His name will be called Master, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no limit to his authority. And no end to his peace. He will rule on David's throne and over his kingdom. Another special prophecy about the Savior is recorded for us in Isaiah 7:14. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. What a unique and special way for a child to come into the world, to be born of a virgin. But maybe that's not surprising considering this child would be unique and special above all others. He would be born of a human mother and would be human like us. He had a body and soul. He ate, he drank, he slept. Ultimately, like us, he died. Though he was human as we are, he was different from you and me in two very significant ways. While we are born in sin and sin daily in our thoughts, words, and actions, this child, as the Son of God, was born holy, without sin. And he maintained that holiness throughout his life. Though facing the same temptations we struggle with and so often give in to, he never once turned against the will of his heavenly Father. He was what we could not be, holy, absolutely perfect, without any sin whatsoever. There's something else amazing about this Savior. Though he was fully human like us, he was at the same time completely God. He is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, the Apostle John reminds us that God the Son was present for and active in the creation of the world. Isaiah calls him the everlasting Father. As God, he has existed from all eternity. And when the time was right, he was born of a virgin and took on human form and was both God and man in one person. Human reason says this is impossible. But the angel Gabriel assures us just as he assured Mary, Nothing is impossible with God.
By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, King David wrote numerous prophecies about his great descendant to come. Psalm 24 is an example. In this psalm, David reminds us that the Savior to come is the King of glory, the Lord who is mighty in battle, and David urges us to welcome him. Please join us as we read responsively a portion of this psalm. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift yourselves up, you ancient doors. Who is this King of glory? The Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them, lift up, you ancient doors. And the King of glory will come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord of armies. He is the King of glory. Psalm 24. The town often forgotten in the Christmas story is Nazareth. Yet this is where the fulfillment of God's promises began. It was an insignificant little village in Galilee that happened to be home to both Joseph and his betrothed, Mary. Although born in Bethlehem, history's greatest and most influential figure would do his growing up in this tiny village and call it his home. It was here that Mary received unannounced a special visitor who told her the news that she had been chosen by God for a very special privilege. We hear now the story of how the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that she would be the mother of the Savior. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin pledged in marriage to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But she was greatly troubled by this statement and was wondering what kind of greeting this could be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, because you have found favor with God. Listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Listen, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, even though she was called barren, and this is her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible for God. Then Mary said, See, I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. <laughs>
In an act of pure grace, God chose Mary and granted her the privilege of being the mother of the Messiah. When Mary wondered how she, a virgin, could be with child, Gabriel assured her that this miraculous course of events was indeed possible because of God's almighty power. To illustrate God's power, Gabriel pointed Mary to another miraculous birth that would be taking place. Mary's relative Elizabeth was also expecting a child. Though she and her husband Zechariah were both well beyond the age of having children, the Lord had intervened in their lives in a miraculous way to grant them a child, just as he had done with Abraham and Sarah centuries before. Once Gabriel had departed, Mary left immediately to visit Elizabeth, her relative. We read from Luke 1. In those days, Mary got up and hurried to the hill country to a town of Judah. She entered the home of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Just as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She called out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? In fact, just now, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed, because the promises spoken to her from the Lord will be fulfilled. Then Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior because he has looked with favor on the humble state of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, because the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up. The lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, but the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then returned to her home. <coughs>
You can just imagine Mary's excitement at being chosen by God to be the mother of the Savior. No wonder her heart overflowed with joy. You can also imagine Joseph's bewilderment when he discovered that his bride-to-be was expecting a child. Since they had not yet come together, Joseph knew that he was not the father of this child. This led him to the only other logical conclusion. His betrothed had been unfaithful. At any other time in history, Joseph would have made a correct assumption. This, however, was not any other time in history. This was the fullness of time when God himself was taking special action to bring his son into the world. To put Joseph at ease and to erase whatever doubts he might have had, the Lord revealed the truth to him about Mary and her child. We hear now the words of Matthew 1. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. His mother Mary was pledged in marriage to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her, so he decided to divorce her privately. But as he was considering these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this happened to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife, but he was not intimate with her until she gave birth to her firstborn son, and he named him Jesus. For thousands of years, God's people had waited patiently and yet eagerly for the Almighty to carry out his plan of salvation. During those years, God had nourished their faith and heightened their anticipation with promises and prophecies about the Savior to come. Finally, when the time was right, God gave the world its greatest gift, his one and only Son. A few moments ago, we saw how the Lord had relieved Joseph's heart of some burdensome concerns. God's gracious and almighty power had brought about Mary's pregnancy. To make sure that everything to do with this child's birth would go exactly according to his plan, God was going to raise his mighty hand again. Not too long before Mary's baby was to be born, an order came from Rome, commanding all people in the empire to go to the city of their ancestors in order to be counted. 
for Joseph and Mary, that meant a four- or five-day trip to Bethlehem in Judea. Little did Caesar Augustus know that his edict was actually God's instrument to lead a humble Galilean couple to the city the Lord had designated centuries before as the birthplace of the Savior. How God works in mysterious ways. In that chosen city, on a night that only God knows, centuries of prophecy were fulfilled. The Son of God, the Incarnate Word, the Savior of the world, was born. Please join us as we read responsibly Luke's account of our Savior's birth. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. <coughs> this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governing Syria. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the town of Nazareth into Judea. <coughs> He went to be registered with Mary, his wife. And so it was that while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. The ultimate paradox, wouldn't you say? History's greatest figure is born not in a mansion, not in a palace, not in a clean, well-kept, comfortable house, but rather in the crudest, most humble of surroundings, in a stable, a little barn. There was no fancy cradle in which to rock this baby. Instead, he was laid in a manger, a feed box for animals. These were not surroundings fit for a king, Yet this is how the king of kings entered the world he himself helped to create. By means of his miraculous conception and birth, Jesus began his state of humiliation. As our perfect substitute, as a man who truly was human, he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, just as Isaiah said. He hungered, he thirsted, he became tired, he wept. He felt every ounce of the agonizing pain that came from the fists that struck him, the scourge that lacerated his back, the thorns that punctured his scalp, and the nails driven through his flesh and bone. Though he was holy, he was declared guilty for our sins and became the object of God the Father's wrath. He was forsaken by his own heavenly Father and felt in his body the tortures of hell itself. 
in order to pay for our sins and win for us eternal life, he suffered all this and then gave up his life on the cross. How awesome, how incredible, how wonderful that our God loves this world, that he loves us so much that he willingly sent his one and only son to such an existence for such a purpose. Even here in the humility of Bethlehem, we see the greatness of God's love. The still small voice of God's Son crying in the manger would one day grow into a voice that would proclaim from the cross, it is finished, announcing that God's plan of salvation had been completed. Our sins have been forgiven. Eternal life has been won. Heaven is our home. Indeed, this is good news of great joy. Let's stand for this hymn. <laughs> remain standing. The birth of a baby is a time for joy for any couple. Parents rejoice and thank God for the gift of a child. No doubt Joseph and Mary thank God as they gazed at this extraordinary baby cradled in Mary's arms. Accompanying the birth of a baby there are usually announcements to loved ones and friends. In our day and age phone calls are made, text messages are sent, notices are placed in the newspaper, and photographs of our baby can be scanned into the computer or taken by our phones and sent anywhere in the world. But nothing can compare to the birth announcement God gave for his son. Seemingly out of nowhere in the dark of night, one of God's angels appeared to lowly shepherds and made the most important birth announcement in history. And we'll read responsibly from Luke 2. There were in the same country shepherds staying out in the fields. <laughs> An angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. 
Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude from the heavenly army praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace with the will toward mankind. Please be seated. We'll continue with the next hymn. And we'll continue reading responsively from Luke chapter 2. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, <coughs> So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph. When they had seen him, <coughs> And all who heard it were amazed by what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things, honoring them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. How do you want people to react when you tell them good news? You hope they will believe you and be excited with you. How did the shepherds react to the news the angel told them? They believed it. They were excited. And it showed. They hurried to Bethlehem to see this child. 
After seeing this blessed baby with their own eyes, their excitement could not be contained. They spread the word concerning this child. Even when they returned, they were glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. But now what about us? The same good news that was proclaimed with the shepherds has been shared with you and me. And how will we react? I pray we can react as the shepherds did. I pray we too will believe this good news so that we may enjoy the blessings of salvation our gracious God gives through this child. I pray this good news will bring hope and happiness to our lives and fill us with a true and lasting joy. Like the shepherds, we too can glorify and praise God for making known to us this good news of great joy. to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward mankind. Amen. The words of God we'll consider briefly this evening are written in the second chapter of the letter to the Hebrews, and we start with verse 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. This is God's word. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, our perfect Savior, dear friends in Christ. Her name was Heather Kruger. Some of you might be familiar with her story. In 2015, she was diagnosed with auto, autoimmune hepatitis and her liver was failing, and she was heading for death, unless she could get a new liver. She needed a donor. And it's kind of an awkward thing. <clears throat> How do you get a new liver? You need someone to die. Someone who has signed that little card that says, yes, you can use my organs if something should happen to me. And not just that, somebody who also is a match. 
so with the tissues and the blood and things, it has to be just right or else the body of the person who receives the new organ will reject it and it won't do any good. So her life is ebbing away and unless something happens, she's going to die. And again, it's kind of awkward. You don't want somebody else to die, but on the other hand, you don't want to die either. <coughs> well, somebody, one of the doctors said, well, you know, there is an alternative. Why don't you see if you can find a live donor? And at first glance, you think, what? Well, the liver is a pretty unique organ in the body. You can cut out, I think it's like half of it, and what's left will grow back, almost like your hair. Cut it off and it'll grow back. So if she could find somebody who was willing to give up half of his or her liver, they could put that in her, and if it would take, then she, her life would be saved. But again, she needed to find somebody who was a match and somebody who was willing. Well, time goes on, and still it's difficult to find somebody. I guess there were a couple people who came forward, but again, it was not a match. It wasn't going to work. Well, finally, a gentleman was, well, he went into the break room at his job, and he heard some people talking about this girl who needed someone to donate part of his liver. He overheard it, and he thought about it, and decided maybe I could check this out. So it turns out he was a match and he was willing and she had life. The operation was a success and she's still alive to this day. There was somebody who had something that was just right and was willing to help. Now, and we, we spoke a little bit about this in the morning. We, we use the example. And you can think about her. Can you imagine on one hand how she felt when she told, was told, yeah, unless you get a new liver, unless there's somebody willing and just right, you're going to die. Can you imagine that emotion? Can you imagine the other emotion when there is somebody and he's willing and it works? Wow. But what about you and me? On one hand, there's the danger, right? Because we're going to die. We're sinful, and not just that we're going to lose our lives, but God has every right to condemn us to eternal suffering in hell unless there's somebody who is just right and willing to help us. And what do we need? What do we need to be right with the one true God? We need to be perfect as he commands, and there has to be death as payment to take away our sins. And that's something we can't do, right? We can never be perfect as God demands. And we said we're sinful the instant our, our life started. We can never be perfect, and because we're sinful, we can die, but our death is not going to make a payment for sin, not the payment that God demands. We can't do it, so we need someone who's just right and willing to do that for us. And what are we told? Since children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. And that, of course, is Jesus, who took on our humanity, becoming like us. As a human being, he was in the position where God's laws applied to him and he was required to obey them and he did as a human being he could die which God demands as payment for sin as Hebrew says without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness but if that's all there was to it he wouldn't be just right to save us the Bible says that no man can redeem the life of another what we need is somebody who's beyond that. Somebody who's human like us, but somebody who is also God. And that's what Jesus is, right? The Bible tells us 
that in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Through the miracle of the virgin birth, that baby born so long in Bethlehem was human like us, but was without sin, and at the same time was completely God, and as true man, true God, he did obey all the commandments for us, and his righteousness counts for us. God looks at you and sees you're just what he wants, right? As true man and true God, his death really did make the full and complete, sin, a complete payment for sin so that they're gone and you're forgiven for all. Jesus was just right. Jesus was willing. And he just didn't give up part of an organ. He gave up his life because he loves you and he wants you to have life, life that will last forever. You'll go back to the story of Heather Kruger and the man named Chris Dempsey. The, the story went on that after the operations and they both healed up, they had contact with each other and eventually they fell in love and they were married. And now they're spending the rest of their lives together with our Savior Jesus, who was just right for us. We're going to spend all eternity with him in glory that will never end, all because he was just right, he was willing, he loved us so much to give himself for us so that we can live forever and one day be with him in the glories of heaven. We think about that baby born in Bethlehem, God's perfect gift, the one who really was just right to save us. Amen. We'll continue with the offering, and as we gather it, we'll sing hymn 54. seated and we'll continue with the response of prayer. Lord God, our Father, in the Old Testament you promised that you would send your Son to set us free from sin, death, and the power of the devil. 
When the time had fully come, you filled the hearts of your believers with joy at the appearance of your Son to redeem the world. <laughs> Please bless our Christmas celebration this year. Keep us from becoming so caught up in worldly festivities that we become frustrated and angry and start to lose the real joy of Christmas. Work through the preaching of the law and the gospel to prepare our hearts for the celebration of Jesus' birth. <laughs> Jesus Hear us now as we bring you our private petition. We thank you, Lord, for your wonderful, amazing love. Help us so that we will always cherish this good news of great joy. Keep us from falling into sin. Keep us faithful to you and to all of your word. Help us to look ahead with eager anticipation to your son's second coming. Hear us now as we pray the prayer he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christmas. The word Mary reminds us that Christmas is a time for joy. Why? Because by God's grace we know this good news of great joy, that God gave his son Jesus to live and die for us. By faith we know who this child is and what he has done for us. We know that our sins have been forgiven. We know that God will always love us. When we die, we know for sure that Jesus will take us to be with him in heaven. This is good news of great joy. 
we have every reason to join in the angel chorus and proclaim day after day, glory to God in the highest, Christ the Savior is born. May the God of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you and keep you tonight and forever. We'll continue now with the lighting of the candles. You should have been given a personal candle here when you walked in. If you don't have one, uh, you can get one from the ushers. Again, little child, use your, use your judgment as to whether they're old enough, old enough to hold this kind of candle safely or if they want to use one of these, you're probably familiar. Bend it until you hear a snap, and it will glow. So, come on forward, gentlemen. We also remind you, always try to hold a lit candle up. When it's time for your candle to be lit, hold the unlit candle like this, and then hold it like that. That way there's less chance for the dripping of the wax.
Let's rise. Merry Christmas, everyone. We can blow out, if you'd like. And maybe we can get some lights back on. Please be seated. Thank you so much for coming, for being here tonight. It's always uh, a neat service, and it's even more special when there's people here to share it with us. And. Um, the singing was just absolutely wonderful. It's so neat to sit up here and to hear God's people singing like that. So thank you. Um, for the ushers, could we maybe just keep the uh, candles lit for a little bit? I think we want to take a picture or two once the lights get back on. Um, just a reminder again, if you'd like to help Brandy Kolke with her uh, family, you can, you can put some money in that offering plate. And again, December 24th, 6 o'clock, the children will lead us in worship with their Sunday school program. And also then we've got Christmas Day service at 9. And then, of course, you can see the note about the Message of Peace radio services. 
Uh, thank you once again for being here. Um, God bless you, everyone, and Merry Christmas.